Welcome everyone to LaGrange Presbyterian Church. My name is Kay Tyler. I have the privilege and really the pleasure of, of doing this on Elle's behalf today. So thank you all for coming. I'm doing double duty as I will be also playing and leading us in worship today. So please forgive me if um, things don't go as planned, but um, I'll try to keep it moving along. So thank you all for coming. Um, I've been a member of this church for 25 years. Um, it's been uh, just the joy of my life to grow in this church. Our children were raised in this church as well, and I have been leading the music for the church for about 20 years. So a um, fan of, of Al and his leadership here, fan of all of you, thank you for being part of my spiritual family, and let's prepare to worship for the Lord. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that our church can gather today in freedom, in peace, and in worship of you. Help us to use our words and songs today to praise you and proclaim our love for you. Fill this room with your glory and your spirit so we may feel your presence here today. We are here to worship you, honor you, our creator, our king. Let ourselves decrease and let you increase in all of us. In your name we pray for this. Amen. We will now sing our song. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Jamie, do you have anything you want to add for that? No, that was great. Okay, very good. Okay. Are we bacon and pancakes? Bacon and pancakes. Okay, very good. Okay, we'll go ahead and sing now. sky. I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in deepest sin, my hand will save. I have made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright, who will bear my light to them, whom shall I save? hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? Here I
Thank you. You all sounded wonderful, by the way. So. <laughs> now we'll turn to our scripture, which I've picked out today, which is Psalm 121. And I assume Psalm 121 was written by David. And it's a prayer for traveling mercies. And I don't know if he was praying for traveling mercies for himself or perhaps he was praying for those that might be on a journey. Whether it's a physical journey or it's a spiritual journey, the psalm relates to all of us that are on a journey. It promises that while we're on a journey, the Lord is watching over you. The Lord's our keeper, our protector. He's the sun by day, sun or moon, day or night. You're coming or you're going. The Lord watches over you. So let us read Psalm 121. I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. He who watches over Israel will not slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. He will be your shade at your right hand. The Lord, the sun will not harm you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch your coming and going, both now and forevermore. Amen? Amen. We'll sing the Gloria together, if you all would stand. I won't play it, but we'll just sing it together. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Amen. Okay. Be seated. All right. Now is our prayer of confession. You know, sin is what separates us from God. And despite our best efforts, we know that we all sin. But how blessed we are that we have his Holy Spirit that gives us the power to confess our sin, turn from sin, so that we no longer desire sin. We can be free from the bondage of sin. So let us say this prayer together, and then we'll follow it with a moment of silence. So please pray this prayer with me. Holy and righteous God, we tremble when we remember our sin and the foolish ways we treat people around us. You call us to love as you first loved us, but we commit great sins against those we love the most. We try to share agape love with others, but rarely look to you to redeem our broken relationships. We forget to pray for ourselves our families and friends, and our shallow attempts at love are exposed. Give us courage to accept our sinfulness and trust your mercy to redeem our relationships with those we love the most. We ask it in the name of our Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen. Father, thank you for the forgiveness of our sins. We know that you despise sin because it separates us from you. Help us, Lord, to not only turn from sin but run away from sin, that we can cut it out of our lives. Help us to hate sin that we know grieves you. Lord, we are weak. The devil is strong, prowling around like a lion, tempting us each and every day. Be our strength be our fortress. Help us to build our obedience to you so that we know your power, your love, and your eternal salvation. 
We pray this through you, your Son, and your Holy Spirit. Amen. The assurance of pardon is next, which is simply the good news that the debt of our sin was paid for on this cross more than 2,000 years ago. It's a debt we owe, and yet through our faith in the Lord, our sins are forgiven. We are redeemed never to be separated from him, from our sin. Our sins are forgiven, and my friends, that is good news. Amen? Amen. Okay. All right, next is our offering, and I will play something during the offering. Um, this is our time to give our tithings to the Lord. The Lord asks us to give back a portion of what we earn. We know that everything we have is his, and he asks for a portion of it in return. Let us all do that with good spirit um, and support our church and the missions of our church. We will read this prayer, and then you will give your tithes. I will play for a minute and then um, come back up here. So let's read the offering prayer. Compassionate Father, thank you that you are our strength and our song. You fill our hearts with joy. May we give our offerings to you with gladness and joy. Everything we have belongs to you, and we rejoice to give some of your abundant gifts back to you. Bless the tithes and offerings we give today. Let the majesty of the Father be the light that guides us. The compassion of the Son be the love that inspires us. And the presence of the Holy Spirit be the power that empowers us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Um, we have our Covenant Church families. Hopefully you all have gotten letters. I got my letter last week. So anyone else getting letters? Is there anyone? Did you get your letter? Very good. Very good. Um, we also want to pray for all of our missionaries that work on our behalf to carry the mission of the Lord around the world. And this is time also to ask you all if you have anything you would like for us to pray for or any updates, celebrations, or anything um, that any needs that you have in the church. So, Lisa, let you go. As most of y'all know, I asked for prayers last week for Casey with her blood pressure issues. Well, she ended up back in the hospital on Sunday evening. Her blood pressure was at stroke level. Um, thank goodness they were able to get it under control and they discharged her on Tuesday, which of course she went back to Louisville to be with the babies. 
Um, they have gotten a room at the Ronald McDonald House, so they're going back and forth to the hospital. Um, on Monday, they put in um, a feeding tube and a colostomy on Hudson. They're going back in this week. Um, they're going to come up with a game plan and, and go back in this week and see what can be done with that. Um, on the bright side, he has gained two ounces this week. Um, he's back up to actually one ounce over his birth weight. Um, Hazley's doing so-so. She's, she's doing okay. She's just got um, some issues with uh, keeping her milk down, so they're trying different things, to different kinds of milk to see what they can put her on that, that she can tolerate. So um, we're moving along just slowly, but mm -hmm. we could continue to use the prayers. Okay, we will pray, continue to pray. Thank you, Lisa. Cat. Hello. <laughs> I don't know how close I need to be. Um, so my brother has to get just a minor surgery on his mouth. Um, mm -hmm. He got a gum disease from not flossing, uh, which he learned his lesson. Um, <laughs> But I don't know, minor surgeries always give me anxiety. I've seen like sure. shows about where people die from minor surgeries. So. Sure. Just, yeah. What's your brother's name? Oh, Landon. Landon. Okay. It's okay. I give praise to the Lord for Jackie doing well. Good. Also, I give praise for the Special Olympics of Kentucky have two special needs adopted kids that are in the softball competition. Lord, I pray for the, them. I pray for the, all the other children. I pray for the parents, how supportive they are. And I pray, Lord, that the special needs or the Special Olympics will always have the resources they need to give these kids an opportunity to do normal things like other kids. May you bless them and their parents and uh, watch over them. Oh, Lord. Mm. Amen. Anyone else? Also, yes, I had a request from the Ritmans. They have two cars, neither of which are working, uh -huh. which is why they're not here this morning. So they're also looking for vehicular prayers. Okay. Oh, very cool. Okay. All right. Anything else? All right. Well, let's bow our head, and I will pray over these that you all shared with us today. Lord... The times are so, so hard, so hard. We have so many challenges. It is so hard to sometimes see through the day. And we know, as we learned in the psalm today, that you watch over us. You're our shade, our protector. You're going to guard us. Protect Hudson as this is not the way most babies start life, but we pray that you will have mercy on him, guide the physicians, and all that will care for him and his mom, Casey, who will definitely have, have issues and concerns with this young, young child. We pray for Lisa as well, Clarence, as they want the best and the happiness and health of their, of their children. We pray for Kat's brother, Landon, as he learns to take better care of his own needs, and we hope that the Surgery will go fine, and we pray that you will watch over the skill of the surgeon as they work on Landon this week. We always pray for Jackie and Jean. He's so, so much in our prayers every day. Watch over Jean as well as he, as he watches over Jackie, and he needs our love and support and your love and support. We pray for the Rittmans that have always had constant car troubles and Lord, let's, let's solve that for them. Let's make this something they will not have to deal with. Let's um, help them as they, as they move from work to ministry and all the things they need to be doing. We pray for all of the people in this church today that are here to worship you, that today had options to not even come and came to be with you in this house of worship where we bring you our worships and will leave today worshiping you. Let us remember all of, the, all of the mercies of this world and so many prayers that, that, Lord, we don't know how to keep asking, but we must keep asking you. 
We cannot go this alone. We need you, Lord. We are ever thankful for the true blessing of your son, Jesus Christ. And we are so thankful for the prayer that he taught us that if we never have anything to pray, that we know we can always pray the Lord's Prayer, which we will now say together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I cast all my cares upon you. you would put up the first screen of my so we are going to sing it's my day I can pick what we're going to sing right that with me. I thought this is an appropriate way to start because this is how I would sum up how I feel when I read through the Bible, that I will never, ever be the same again. I want to spend just a few minutes today talking about my journey of reading through the Bible from beginning to end. I've read through the Bible, I read through the Bible every year, and I've done it for a number of years. We did it as a church a number of years ago for an entire year, But I was doing it actually long before that. I always tell Al every time of the year that I finish reading the Bible. Usually takes me about seven to eight months. And then sometimes I start right back and read it from the beginning again. I'll ask Al a lot of questions throughout the year as I read the Bible. I'll read his commentaries, which he has provided to us. I'll Google many questions myself. And I've read the Bible more than 15 times, probably more than 20 times. I have no idea. And I don't say that because I plan to ever be any type of a Bible scholar. But I read the Bible, as probably most of you do, as a way to have a deeper faith and to learn more about God. What I have learned and can appreciate is that it answers every single question of life. You know, the things we are going through these days with the pandemic and politics and race issues, gender issues, it's just unbelievable. And yet, you will be able to find any question you have about any of those issues, you will be able to find the answer to that in the Bible. His word is perfect. His word is complete. I read the Bible from beginning to end. I tend to be a very methodical, linear person. I like to go from A to B to C. And I understand that there are a lot of reading plans that have people break up, the, break up reading into read some of the New Testament, read some of the Old Testament. I understand why that's done that way. Reading through the Old Testament is very difficult. 80% of the Bible is the Old Testament. So it takes a long time before you even get to the birth of Christ. It covers 4,000 years. It is not a linear progression of books. They can repeat. They can cover long spans of time, short spans of time. It can be difficult also to figure out, was Jeremiah on the earth at the same time as Isaiah? When was Ruth on earth? So putting 
all of the people in the Old Testament on the B.C. timeline before Christ can be a real challenge. Whereas the New Testament is much shorter. It only spans 60 years. It has a lot easier themes. The birth of Christ, Jesus' life, his death, his ascension. And the authors are fewer, mostly the disciples, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. And a lot of the New Testament was written by Paul. It expounds on the Holy Spirit, God's grace, being obedient to God, how eternity is promised to all of us that believe that God is sovereign. But if you put them together, the New Testament and the Old Testament, it would be similar to the bookends of our life. We start with creation. We were all born in his image to live in eternity with him. We were all birthed into a fallen world of sin. And the rest of the Bible through Revelation is God's unrelenting offer of hope that we can be saved and have an eternity with him. You know, the end of our physical life is going to be the beginning of our spiritual and eternal life with him. The Bible begins with a beginning, and it ends with a new beginning. When I read through the Old Testament the first few times, four words came to mind. I don't get it. I don't get it. The Old Testament was very difficult to understand. The Old Testament is a constant cycle of God's judgment and hope. Judgment, hope. God's judgment on his people and his hope that they would turn from sin. People worshipped idols. They turned from God. God would bring his wrath. God that used prophets and kings to tell people to trust. God would relent, rescue them, and then the idol worship started over and over and over again. You also read 613 laws in the Old Testament. And really cool themes like circumcision, clean, unclean animals, animal sacrifices, endless rituals that dealt with worship, marriage, food, hygiene. The Old Testament was full, full of really cool themes like slavery, severe sexual deviance, horrible plagues, so much bloodshed, so much war. But you know, once my head moved past thinking about the Old Testament literally, I started realizing how it, what it should mean to me in the spirit of which God intended it. The Old Testament is full of God's attempt to use ordinary people to tell others who God is. And Adam, would you put up my next screen? This is who God is. I am. God is I am. He used the Israelites as his chosen people, moving them into exile, protecting them, returning them to the promised land. He used judges, like Moses, Joshua, Samuel, Samson. He used priests, Aaron, protector of the, of the temple. And then he used kings. We know King David. We know King Solomon. The Old Testament also t goes through 35 more kings that were rulers over Israel and Judah. And you know what? Most of them were bad. Most of the kings were bad. Then come the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jonah, Hosea, Zechariah. Judges, priests, kings, prophets. Judges, kings, priests, prophets. Using ordinary, flawed, imperfect humans to tell who God is. And you know what? Most of them failed. They failed. They didn't, it wasn't their fault wasn't the fault that the failure of these judges, kings, priests, and prophets. They often failed forward, which meant they had periods of success. But despite all of their efforts, the cycle started over and over again. Cycle of sin, turning from God, failing to trust him year after year, generation after generation. Why did God not give up on all of these stiff-necked, hardened hearts, Sinful people. Why did God not give up? He did it for love. He did it for love. 
His unconditional, sacrificial, unrelenting, radical, furious, exhaustive love for his people. You know, man-made love that we feel today is all going to go away. We love our family. <clears throat> our family will pass away. We fall in and out of love. We get hurt by love. All of that is man-made love. It is only, there's only one love that will never fail us, and it is God's love. I find that to be pure joy, that he can't love me any less or any more than he does today. And I can't do anything less or anything more to earn his love. I find that to be just awesome. He never abandoned the Israelites. He's never going to abandon you or me. In the Old Testament, I also realize that God's character is one of being counterintuitive. Counterintuitive meaning the opposite of what you believe would, would happen. Because, you know, God didn't value what the world values. And here are some examples. He picked Moses. Moses was a stutterer. He picked him over Aaron. Aaron, his eloquent, well-spoken brother. He picked David over all of his brothers. Samuel went to Jesse, who was David's father, and said, Show me your sons. We are in need of a king. Jesse shows him all of his sons. Samuel says, Is that all of your sons? Jesse says, I have one more, a small shepherd boy in the backfield. Samuel says, bring him. Tells David, you are chosen to be our king. He picked Jacob over Esau. Esau was the older twin, the birthright of the father Isaac. He picked Joseph. Joseph, who was a show-off, big mouth, younger brother, had 11 older brothers that were all well-spoken, well-put-together, Smart guys, and he picked Joseph over his 11 brothers. He picked Jonah. Jonah, a reluctant missionary that ran as fast away from God, as far away from God as he could. He ran onto a boat. God chases him on the boat, throws him overboard into a storm, into the belly of a whale, and says, Jonah, I need you to lead my people in Nineveh. You see, God... God didn't pick Goliath. He picked Jonas. He picked Moses. He picked Joseph, David. Even God's covenants, his promises, are counterintuitive. He told Noah, I am disgusted with this world. I am going to save your family, but I am wiping everything else out. But my covenant with you is that I will never destroy this world even though I know my people will sin. He called Abraham. Abraham said, I will make a covenant with you to be the father of nations. You will move my people to a land, and I will make you great. Abraham said, where am I going? God said, follow, just go. You will go. Abraham says, how can I be the father of nations? I am 100 years old. My wife is 90 years old. How will we ever be? How will I ever be a father? And as we know, he was a father of Isaac. He told da David, my covenant with you is that your throne will be established forever. Through your descendant, there will be a son, David, that will, that your son will save this world. David said, God, let me build your throne on this earth. Your temple is in a tent, and I am living in a palace. And God said, no, I have called someone else to build, your, to build my temple. He called his son Solomon. It's through this, this counterintuitive character of God, doing the opposite of what you think he's going to do, I started seeing this counterintuitive faith of Noah, of Abraham, of David, trusting God despite not having all of the answers. Isn't that what God tells us to do? Isn't that what faith is? Being sure of what we hope for, but yet certain of what we don't see. The most profound message of the Old Testament, God's promise of hope that someone is coming. That is the Old Testament. There's multiple places in the Old Testament that 
infer that someone is coming. But there's multiple places where it specifically describes what did happen when Jesus came to earth. In Isaiah, 700 years before Jesus was born, a virgin will conceive and bear a son whose name will be Emmanuel. And we all know that Mary was that virgin. Micah, 800 years before Christ was born, out of, Beth, out of you, Bethlehem, will come one who shall be the ruler over Israel. We all know Jesus Christ was born in Bethlehem. David, a thousand years before Jesus was born, my God, why have you forsaken me? They mocked me, hurled insults at me, they nailed me to a cross, piercing my hands and feet. That's told by David. Zechariah, a Messiah will ride into Jerusalem on a donkey to be hailed as a king. We know that Jesus rode in to Jerusalem on a donkey with palm branches being waved, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And Isaiah saying, someone is coming who will be pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that was on him brought us peace by his wounds. We are healed. He will be led like a land of slaughter, assigned a grave with the wicked, yet he had done no violence. Jesus Christ, the suffering servant. Each and every prophecy of the Old Testament would come true. Why? Again, why did God give all of these prophecies to these kings? David, Isaiah, Zechariah. Micah, why did he give them these prophecies? To give people hope, hope, hope that someone is coming, that God would send his king, a savior, a descendant of King David. You know, this hope is not like our secular hope. We hope in a lot of things in our world, don't we? I call that more wishful thinking. We hope the coronavirus is going to go away. We hope UK will have a great basketball team this year, right? So, but this is biblical hope. Biblical hope is an assurance. It's a promise. It is a confident expectation that God keeps his promises, that God is sent, would send a Savior. God's faithfulness, his hope, his radical and perfect love, faith, hope, love, all cornerstones of the Old Testament and all resembling the character of God. I run a company and I report to a board of directors. And the board of directors is, comes in for a quarterly meeting. And as you'd expect, they want to talk about how the company is doing, what are the results of the company, how are we doing, and Sometimes I would consider the board to be helpful. Sometimes it can be trouble. But um, the board, um, I would def describe it sometimes if the business is doing well and we have a good quarter, it's a great meeting. All is, all is well. If the company may have some struggles or if we have any issues going on, I, I think of it like a cross between a root canal and a colonoscopy. So it's a lot of prodding and probing and some pain and a lot of discomfort. So sometimes board meetings can go like that. But the mission of the board is to help the company be successful. Financial success, community success, uh, taking care of our customers and, um, and our employees. So the board has multiple roles. Sometimes they advocate, encourage, support, cheerlead. Other times, they are critical. They are judgmental. They overrule. They correct. They change. And I thought to myself as I was thinking through today, who would be on the board of director of Kay's Life? If I could pick anyone to be on my board of director that I could meet with each quarter to help guide my life, who would I pick from the Bible to be on my board of directors? So here they are. Here they are. When I first wanted to talk about the board of directors, I thought, I wrote down who I wanted. I had 10 names. So we won't be here that long. So I narrowed it down to four. And one's going to be pretty simple. But I thought, 
who would be the, the ones that I've, have meant the most to me in the Bible, I've learned the most, and, and were impressed upon me how to better lead my life. Let's all assume on our board of directors, we all get God. God is the chairman of the board, chairman of the board, chief executive officer. We all get God on our board of directors. So that's this chair. The other chairs I'm going to tell you are two from the Old Testament. One is from the New Testament. I picked Moses. No one in the Bible had a closer relationship with God, I believe. Moses was a murderer. He murdered an Egyptian, head in, hid in the desert for 40 years until he was called by God to lead the Israelites when he was 80 years old. You know, Moses was a whiner. He whined that he was not eloquent. God, use my brother Aaron. He whined through the ten plagues. He had so much self-doubt, always saying to God, what should I do, what should I do? He was almost killed by God for not circumcising his own sons. And yet he had his moments. There was a time when God said, I'm going to kill all the people. Moses convinced him to not destroy the people. Moses shepherded the Ten Commandments twice, which became law. And I believe the moral compass of what, what we consider right and wrong today started with the Ten Commandments. And ultimately, he still was not chosen by God to lead the people into the promised land because he disobeyed God. God said, trust me that that rock will produce water. Your people are thirsty. Moses didn't trust him. Struck the rock with a staff, which gave water, but it angered God. And God said, you will not be chosen to lead my people. Moses, an ordinary but flawed child of God. That's me. That is me. God helped fight his battles so he didn't have to go it alone. I want God to help fight my battles. And yet Moses was held accountable for his actions and inactions. And we don't know why God called him and then uncalled him, and we don't have to know. We just have to trust God. I want Moses, that first seat on my board of directors. The second one is Ruth. If you've never read the book of Ruth in the Old Testament, please do. It's a short book. It's only four chapters. One of the most beautiful stories I've ever read. Ruth was a Moabite. Her husband died. She was left with her mother-in-law named, named Naomi. Naomi said, Ruth, go back to your family. I cannot, I have no more sons to offer to you to be a husband. Go back to your family. I have nothing to offer you. What does Ruth do? Ruth says, where you go, I go. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. She clung to Naomi. Naomi had nothing to offer her, yet Ruth was willing to give up her life for her mother-in-law, Naomi. Naomi goes on to say, we're going to need a relative to protect us. We need a redeemer. She sends Ruth into the crops to glean, to get food for them. These were vineyards were owned by Boaz. Boaz knows he will be taking care of Naomi and Ruth. <clears throat> Naomi tells Ruth, lay at his feet so he will see us and redeem us. She obeys. Ruth did not need a husband. Ruth needed a redeemer. Isn't that what God has done for us? He's redeemed us. As the story goes, Boaz would buy the land, buy the rights to protect Ruth and Naomi. He ends up marrying Ruth. Boaz was Ruth's redeemer. Jesus Christ is the Boaz of our lives. He's our redeemer. I want Ruth. I want the obedience of Ruth. I want the humility of Ruth. Humility where she considered others better than herself. I want obedience and humility of Ruth to permeate my life. So my second chair is Ruth. The third one is going to be from the New Testament. 
There are a couple other choices, I think, ahead of Peter, but I chose Peter. You read a lot about Paul in the, in the New Testament. It's hard to pass up Paul, really hard to pass up Paul. I'd like, I'm going to see Paul in heaven. I'm going to go talk to Paul. It's going to be a good one. John is also another one. I'd like to ask him about Revelation, all of those visions and everything he learned about how this is all going to end. I'd love to, I'd love to hear that from John. But yet I, I couldn't move away from Peter. You know, Al talked about Peter last week. I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my gosh, he's, he's taking over what I was going to talk about. But um, Peter, so impulsive, and yet such a work in progress. Jesus Christ sees him and sees him fishing and says, follow me. Peter does. He tells Jesus, I will walk on water for you to show you how faithful I am to you. And he does. And yet, we know what happened. He tried to walk on water, and he couldn't. His faith grew weak, and Jesus had to save him. He was so quick to turn his back on Jesus, to save his own skin. Jesus, he denied Jesus three times. We've heard that story so many times. Do you know, do you know him? Peter would be like, no. Don't you know Jesus? No. Don't you, weren't you with him? No, I didn't know him. Peter was definitely a work in progress. So am I. So am I. And as flawed as Peter was, he was probably the most transformed when he saw the risen Savior. He ran to the empty tomb when he heard that Christ was alive. Overjoyed when he saw him and Christ appeared to them saying, Peace be with you. I love this next story. Several weeks later, Peter sees Jesus <clears throat> on the shore while he's fishing. He's out in a boat. Peter sees him. It's the Lord! It's the Lord! Peter jumps off the boat in his garments, swims to shore to see the Lord. Can you imagine the weight of his garments as he was swimming to see the Lord? Oh, gosh. It's as if his faith was as small as a mustard seed and had just grown into the biggest tree. Jesus Christ again three times, as if to negate when Peter had denied him three times, he asks Peter, Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord. Attend to my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes. Three times, tells Peter, feed my sheep, tend my lambs, take care of my sheep. It's as if he was telling him, <clears throat> I'm leaving this earth. <clears throat> Ascending to be with my father. <clears throat> but you stay, take care of my people, build my church. Peter received the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> spent the remainder of his life in an incredible and obedient walk of faith and discipleship, converting Jews, converting Gentiles, building God's church on earth. Peter, the greatest story of redemption, always being worked on by God. Us flawed, impulsive, imperfect people. God, please never stop working on me. I want Peter in that seat. So we're rounding third and coming home. Just a few more things I want to touch on in the Bible. <clears throat> There's a few things that I read about in the Bible, learned a lot about, that are still very real and tangible things that we see today. And when I see them or think about them, I'm never the same twice. So here's the first one. Anyone know what that is? <laughs> it's a mustard seed. Now, Al has brought in mustard seeds in here before. I've seen them. Um, a mustard seed, you read about a lot in the Bible. It's about the big, as big as a speck of sand. Barely, you can barely see a mustard seed. And yet these seeds will grow into 30-foot bushes or trees. The Bible says we only need faith the size of a mustard seed to accomplish things that are as massive as trees or as improbable of moving mountains. And I always thought to myself, how 
can that be? Doesn't God want our faith to be massive and big and all of that? But what I've learned is the very first thing God wants from us in the tiniest of forms is faith. The first thing. We have to believe God is real. We have to. That has to be the basis. We have to believe God is real, and it can be in the tiniest of forms. I've learned that my small faith can be shown in small acts, and that's good. Prayer, kindness, service, all signs of faith. There's power in all small acts of of kindness and faith. I love the story in the Bible about the woman, the poor woman that put two coins in the box. This was she was giving her money to the to the temple, to the treasury. Jesus Christ saw that and he said, All you rich people are putting money in from your wealth. She is putting money in from everything she had. Everything. Look how big her faith is in that small act. <clears throat> Our faith is meant to grow. We are in an active walk of faith. Faith is not a box we check off to say we've got it. It grows, it grows, it grows. The more, the deeper our love and relationship is with God, the bigger our faith will be in our lives. God's love does not depend on the size of our faith. Thank goodness. He remains faithful even in our moments of weakness, and we have them. It's through his grace we're saved through faith and not from our acts. It's his gift. Faith, the size of a mustard seed. The next, sheep. Now, I don't see sheep every day. Don't see them a lot, but so many stories of shepherds, sheep, lambs, all used throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Abraham, Jacob, Moses, David were all shepherds. Sheep are weak, dumb, defenseless, no sense of direction. They have poor eyesight. They can literally panic themselves to death. They have no redeeming qualities. Can't live without a shepherd. Their only quality is being used for food and clothing. And then shepherds, the guardians of the sheep, always looking out for the sheep. The sheep can hear them. But it's a dirty job, lowly job. In fact, the shepherds most of the time are spending their nights in the field with the sheep. Not a high-class job at all. And yet God first came to the shepherds. He didn't come to the kings. He came to the shepherds. The angels proclaimed to them, a Savior has come. These men who had so little, yet were so easy to believe, that they should go to Bethlehem and see the Savior God is our shepherd. We are his sheep. We are the weak and defenseless. And I look at that flock up there, and I wonder, which one would be me? (laughs) Would I be in the middle of the flock, kind of being jostled around, following the crowd, or would I be the one to wander off and hope to be found? Would I be scared, confused, hopeless, Am I going to be like the prodigal son, not worthy to be found? We have God's promise. In Ezekiel chapter 34, God tells Ezekiel, As a shepherd looks after his scattered flock, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered on the day of darkness and clouds. I will gather them, pasture them, tend to them, search for them, tend to their injuries, and strengthen them. See, we're we're a flock of sheep. We have 0% survival skills. We are 100% reliant on a shepherd that's never going to abandon his sheep. Never going to abandon you and me. The next... I think the call to help the poor, probably one of the strongest callings in the Bible, almost as strong as being called to be a disciple. 
in the book of Leviticus. They had a jubilee every seven years where they freed slaves, returned the land to the rightful owners, forgave debts every seven years. It was God's command that the riches of the world were shared with the poor so the poor would not ever stay poor for the good of everyone. God wanted to cancel debts every seven years so no one lived in poverty. Could you imagine our world today if all our debts were canceled every seven years? Would, would our wealth be redistributed to help the poor so everyone was out of debt? Or would we look at it to have an opportunity to accumulate more? You know, the poor have very little of what this world values. The world teaches us to value money, possessions, family, career, accomplishments, things. Sometimes I wonder if the poor are closer to God than any of us because they don't have the stuff that distracts us from God. Jesus Christ was poor. He had no home. He had no possessions. He had nothing that this world desires. And I know, did we look at the homeless and the poor? And I will say I'm guilty of this as well. How did they get there? Where's their family? What are the circumstances that led them to this? What if I give them money and they're just going to use it for drugs? And yet, how can I say I have faith and yet not willing to help somebody in need? How can this matter so much to God and matter so little to us? If I'm called to give the shirt off my back, why can't I give the money out of my wallet? What if that was me sitting there? Would our Savior pass me by? Finally, my friends, the cross. I can never look at this the same twice. This is probably the most beautiful cross I've ever seen. It's polished, the stained glass, it's brilliant. It's absolutely beautiful. I was raised in a Catholic church, and in the Catholic church you have a crucifix, which is more like this, where Jesus is, they have the image of, 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 the, of Jesus on a cross. That's what the Catholics do. And I realize that there is meaning for why we look at this cross now without Jesus on it, because it's, he's no longer on the cross. That is good news. So he, he is not hanging on the cross. We should rejoice in his resurrection. But for me, I just don't want to ever forget this. And I think we've, we've sanitized the cross because this is hard to look at. It's very hard to look at every day. And yet, I don't ever want to forget. I don't want to pass this beautiful cross. I want to remember him hanging. This cross intersects with judgment and love. On one side, the suffering of Jesus. He was nailed, tortured, beaten, hung on a cross. And then on the other side is the healing, for he did it for all of us. He took the death we all deserved. We do not have to hang on. He took our debts to the cross with him. I see a cross on one side of judgment. The judgment was passed on Jesus. You are convicted of blasphemy. He was convicted by the very people he was trying to save. The judgment on Jesus. And yet, I see the other side of the cross of forgiveness. Of Jesus being raised up. And him saying, Father, forgive them. I know not what, that they know not what they do. And the most unbelievable act of forgiveness, the thief that is on the cross next to Jesus, the thief that says, remember me. This thief had nothing to offer Jesus. He was getting ready to die. That thief could not come down off of the cross, 
do any works, prove his love for God. He had nothing to offer. His final moment of life, he realizes Jesus is the Savior and says, remember me. And what does Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Such forgiveness. Finally, on one side, the wrath of God. God saying to my sinless human son, I will pour my cup of wrath on you. I will abandon you. I will reject you. On the other side, so I don't ever have to do that to my people. They will never be rejected, never be abandoned. This cross of love, love that cannot get any wider, deeper, longer than it is today. God's perfect and complete love. The Bible is the greatest love story ever written to depict God's love for you and for me. It's perfect, complete love. Amen? Amen. Thank you all. All right. Um, we will close with, we will sing the song, I Will Never Be the Same Again. close in a prayer if you want to take the hand of those around you. Lord, we are so blessed that we have our church family with us today. I look at all of you beautiful people and I know that you love the Lord. I hope sometime this week that you have some way in, in your life that you encounter someone that needs a little bit of your faith to be seen. Show them your faith. And now... The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us forever and forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.